Welcome back again to BadQuaker.com podcast. Today is podcast number 107. I'm Ben. I'm Kai. You want to start with the virtual private network thing? We can start with that, yeah. That's going to be an easy one to cover. Yeah. We've, I've talked to before, and I think, we, I think you and I have talked about virtual private networks as a way that uh, libertarians or people in the liberty movement, whether they're anarchists or whatever, mm-hmm. can organize and keep, we could set up avenues within the internet that nobody else can see and that we can regulate who gets in there right. and discuss anything that we want to s- discuss and be entirely private in the process. Which, I mean, these things exist. There yeah. are people, you know, I, I, I'm not on those networks because yeah, well, I'm not, not cool. cool. Yeah, we're not cool enough to be you know, invited. I don't know the secret handshake and the... And the wink. <laughs> but they do exist. And, and in the important thing is, is that we need many of them. Yeah. Because yeah. much like any other black market thing that takes place Mm -hmm. um eventually the state will stumble upon it and shut it down and so we need to have you know backups and back alleys and you know secondary meeting places and And, uh what brought this back up to me was yesterday uh on lourockwell.com and i'll try to remember to put a link to this in the on the page where this uh podcast appears that part always confuses me on how to say that in a smooth way you know because you're supposed to say everything smooth on a podcast or right. on the radio or whatever but anyway um the link or the uh, the story on on lou rockwell was actually peeled off of a website called international man and it's a whole thing about how important it would be to have uh, virtual private networks like this how to set them up how to set them up from even though you're in let's say let's say you're in the US mm-hmm. you can set one up that's based outside of the US so literally the US government and Google and your internet service provider and nobody else even can tell it's there mm-hmm. and yet you can access it from inside the US log on to it do all the stuff that you do on a regular on the regular internet except mm-hmm. it's all well now I, sh- I shouldn't say it like that you can't once you're on the virtual private network you can't go out and do google searches and float around to right. youtube or whatever you can only do what's within that network right so if you have 20 other like-minded people uh five of them have blogs on that network mm-hmm. um and you one have like of, a forum yeah you have a forum there or even a couple forums and you can do all that privately where only you people who are authorized can see it uh, and the whole rest of the world can't see it. So I think that would be really handy. You know, I was when I was talking to uh, Don Meinshausen, um, he was talking about how I should, uh, he was suggesting to me that I should um, get in touch with a lot of other podcasters who are liberty-oriented podcasters and get some kind of an association going among us. Not so that uh, not, you know, not so we can all be saying the same thing and do, you know, but, but so that we can form ways of supporting each other and get the message out to as many different people as possible. Right. Rather than just talking to each other. Right. Because you know, there's a tendency in the liberty movement to, to preach to the choir. Well, it's, it's, it's a lot less frustrating than trying to go out and, and see new people and, because Mm -hmm. there's going to be pushback from that. But if you're Mm -hmm. in your own little community and you say something like, you know, well, what about what Rothbard said? Everybody's going to know. Oh, yeah, well, Mm -hmm. you know. But when you say that to somebody who's not in your little circle, they're like, what? Yeah. What does that mean? And that's I made this comment on other podcasts in referring to Ron Paul. That's kind of a problem we have within us. Ron Paul will get up to speak, and he'll make a reference to say to the federal reserve or Mm -hmm. to not being aggressive towards other nations or whatever. And those of us in the know, those of us who know about the federal reserve, those of us who understand Ron Paul's policy on not being aggressive toward other nations, this makes sense to us. Right. But someone on the outside who hasn't read the Ron Paul books, who doesn't, who's never investigated the federal reserve, who, who, you know, doesn't understand that, 
uh, the reason why Afghanistan is a threat to us is because we're over there beating the crap out of Afghanistan. Right. The reason why Osama bin Laden attacked us was not because he, he hated our liberty. It's because we were squatting troops in a country that he felt was holy ground. Right. And he made that very clear. And we've alternated between giving him tons of money and... And shooting at him. And shooting at him <laughs> for decades. Yeah. So, uh, so a person who understands these things, when Ron Paul speaks, it makes sense. But to your average Rudy Giuliani fan walking around out there, they, they hear Ron Paul say these things and they literally think he's nuts because mm -hmm. they don't have a base of information to, to judge this by. Right. So I think among libertarians, we kind of have that, that is almost ep epidemic among us is that we'll make these, you know, or, or we'll debate a, some aspect of a Rothbardian, uh, you know, theory that makes no sense to anybody outside the loop. Right. And it's very easy to get stuck inside a little portion of the internet mm -hmm. where everybody's reading the same blogs and everybody's talking about the same things. And, mm -hmm. and it's hard to break out of that because when you start following link trails, yeah. they always link back <laughs> to sites within that community. Right. And so, you know, I found that myself in that situation the other day. I, I was following along link trails and suddenly I was in a part of the internet where, you know, people were like, <laughs> soy is good and socialism is the best way. And, and I was like, there are still people who believe this? How did I get in this section of town? <laughs> like, I shouldn't be here. I don't belong here. Roll up the windows. <laughs> My garment doesn't even show the streets in this part of town. Oh, no. <laughs> that, I'm that, doomed. That, uh, what, Chevy Chase moment? Roll them up. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it's it's almost shocking when you're suddenly. That, that's a vacation reference. Yes. I think they're in St. Louis in that episode, in that part of the. But yeah, sure. But I'm sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> but it's very easy to get surrounded in a little bubble mm -hmm. and think that everybody knows this and yeah. that it's obvious. Right. But it's not. Right. You know, mainstream media is not talking about this sort of stuff. Right. There's really when you're on the outside mm -hmm. and you're going, okay. Well, you know, I've seen them talking about Ron Paul on TV. Yeah. I don't know what he stands for. I don't know who this dude is. Right. It's hard to break into, you know, what is the actual fact. Yeah. Um, because when you when you just look at the Ron Paul websites, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of... Yeah, they assume you already are part of the club. Yeah. and <laughs> And so I think that there needs to be sort of introductions and primers and, mm -hmm. and, you know, not to come at it from, from the perspective of, oh, well, you don't know anything. Right. But well, this is not common knowledge. This is yeah. not stuff that's being taught. And this was Don's point when I was talking to him is that, you know, well, to paraphrase him horribly, but to, <laughs> but to try to get the, maybe the same idea that we were talking about, there are people who like him, who are very, um, they're very good at what might be considered evangelism. Mm -hmm. They're very good at reaching out to people who are not of us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes from from the perspective of someone like me, like, you know, I'm, I, I don't mean to be tooting my own horn, but I'm pretty hardcore on what I accept as being, this fits the zero aggression principle and, and that doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I really, want to uh, grind things down and get right down to the root and mm -hmm. find out what is pure, what is not pure. And some libertarians are not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Some like to have a softer uh, standard that they want to live by. Mm -hmm. And others are even softer than that. I mean, we if you think about how wide the scale is, all the way from the radical, you know, like, like there are things that, that I read about Rothbard or things that he's written that I read, and I'm like, Dude, you're too soft. Right. You missed it there. You're not you're not hard enough. You're not <laughs> you know, you're not hardcore Rothbard. I'll take away your libertarian papers. But at the same time there are people who are like I live in a van and I don't report any income to the government yeah. and I don't and if you if you are using Federal Reserve notes then you're yeah. immoral and you're living off the system. Yeah. So for them you know, I'm a sellout. Yeah. I'm a total sellout. You're, you're on the internet. You're paying Time Warner to be on the internet. You're a sellout. Yeah. You know, 
Um, so, you know, so we have this wide spectrum and then there's all the way the other end where there's people at the Cato Institute where you're looking at things that they write and you're like, you realize this is the Cato Institute, not the Heritage Institute, right? Because right. it's that what they're saying is so washed out. You can't find, uh, you can find almost no aspects of libertarian in them. Right. And yet they're there. Anyway, so, so the spectrum is very wide of what is within the libertarian movement. Right. And so if uh, uh, going back to the earlier thing about uh, the podcasters, if all the different podcasters had a way of getting together and communicating like a forum where only, you know, where they, where they were all talking or something like that, and if they could do it in private where they don't have to worry about offending or getting arrested for saying the wrong thing or whatever, right. um, then we could maybe tune some podcasts more towards teaching, some towards evangelism, some towards uh, practical things like, you know, I think of like uh, Jack over at the Survival Podcast. Uh, what he does is very practical stuff as far as gardening mm -hmm. and um, your finances, how to control your finances. But when he wanders into libertarian theory, he stinks. <laughs> I mean, he's my friend, so I can say this. You know, right. I like him. He and I have shaken hands, and I've eaten his chicken, so I can say <laughs> this. I like Jack a lot. But when it, when he wanders into libertarian theory, he needs to go back to gardening. <laughs> well, you know, I would not be able to do a podcast on gardening. Uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, and I've learned a ton from Jack on stuff like that. You yeah. know, uh, I was just struggling in the dark before I found his podcast. But, but so all of us together, you know, we, we can work these things out if all these podcasters, and this was Don's suggestion, mm -hmm. that, that it was obvious to him, and it was like a, a light came on to me. It's like, wow. You know, he's like, well, why didn't you think of that before? Right. You know? <laughs> but, uh, of course, he's been in this game since like 1965 or something, right. too. So actually, no, since the Goldwater campaign, and I believe that was 64. Mm hmm so he's been in this since, uh, you know, probably more like 62 or 63 mm -hmm. when he start, started with Goldwater. But uh, anyway, where was I going with all that? Virtual private networks. Virtual private networks. So we need, we need two things. We need, and I'm not technical, so I can't, I'm not the inventor here, but we need a virtual private network and we need to arrange uh, uh, communication between podcasters so that we can help each other out, learn from each other. And there needs to be multiple levels mm -hmm. because you don't want to be handing out invitations to everybody to certain levels of, of the virtual private networks. Yeah. But at the same time, there are, you know, you should be able, you should have a staging area. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're allowed to to bring initiates into this staging area, mm -hmm. they can. Then they have to have a t trial run, and then they can get the passwords to, you know. <laughs> and I don't know. I'm just envisioning something like Wikipedia, mm -hmm. but based on archives of people's podcasts and Liberty mm -hmm. blogs and and things like that. Because the other thing that you have is you have really good information, but because it's the internet, yeah, you know something happens and you lose your domain registration and, and it all disappears. It's gone. Um, yeah. Uh, and as an example of how handy this could be, if you're listening to this podcast right now, you're listening to you, you're probably, you might be noticing the sound of my voice and Kai's voice is dramatically improved to what it was six months ago. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is almost entirely because of help given to us by Michael W. Dean over at Freedom Fiends. Mm -hmm. He bumped into our podcast and he had very specific suggestions and he has worked with me on how to, you know, improve the sound quality mm -hmm. and, and we're not perfect yet, but I think, uh, almost every podcast we're getting a little bit better and a little bit better on the sound quality. Right. Uh, and so that's just one person helping me. I mentioned Jack a minute ago, Jack Spearco. When I very first started uh, looking at the possibility of having a podcast, uh, Jack was a great inspiration for me, but also Jack has a series of teaching lectures that he does that laid out all the basics of what I had to do to get one going. Mm -hmm. So it was by uh, being able to you know, go through that series, I was able to, to do this to begin with. Mm -hmm. So the more that all of us together start to... Uh, and, and these are like... If I hadn't bumped into Jack, right. then I wouldn't have that. If I if if Michael W. Dean had not bumped into my podcast, 
they wouldn't have done that right because i hadn't discovered his yet so if there was a way to organize all these and then put them in where we can all be private with it too then we have the security mm -hmm. the privacy and we have the advantage of being able to, to you learn also from each have other. a built-in network that says you know hey badquaker.com just got raided by yeah you know, we need to by the milk police right we need to get together either legal support or mm -hmm. monetary support or whatever yeah and you know it it builds in community mm -hmm. that you can then rely on when and and not if when, when the yeah. state begins to crack down on podcasters yeah cuz that's going to happen yeah i mean it's only logical when when radio began mm -hmm. it was free and yeah. you, you just yeah, they could actually just anybody. I just whacked my mic. <laughs> anybody could uh, uh, set up a radio station and broadcast, mm -hmm. and and as loud as you wanted, you know. Mm -hmm. And they would have eventually. Uh, I think I can't remember who. One of the guys at the Mises Institute did a whole thing on this, and I can't remember which which one it was. It might have been Doug French, but I'm not sure. Uh, did a whole thing on how the FCC was able to come in and become the the nasty monster that they are and control the airwaves the way that they do. But uh, prior to that, there was some confusion between potential radio stations, mm -hmm. but they were in the process of working it out, well, and they, and they would have. it's not good for either one of them to have that. Right, right. It's better to, to figure out, let the market figure out solutions to these. Mm -hmm. But the government swooped in, and within a very short period of time, pretty much all the radio broadcasting was done by a very small group of companies. Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, it's only a matter of time until, you know, mm -hmm. in order to podcast, you have to mm -hmm. be part of the National Podcast Association or yeah. whatever. But could you imagine if there were, um, let's say you have this uh, horrible futuristic uh, socialist fascist country where you can't move around freely, you, the internet is restricted and all these kind of a thing, and you, you can't get to free podcasts and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then you're in a internet, you're in a, yeah, you're in a coffee shop someplace and on a napkin that didn't get cleared off your table is written in felt pen, a series of numbers and it says, Freedom podcast or something mm -hmm. like that. Bad Quaker podcast, you know, for freedom or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there's a code right there. And you're like, I wonder what that is. Mm -hmm. And with that code, that would get you into the vir virtual private network, but only to a lev level where you could just barely get that first taste of what it was. Mm -hmm. And you just got it off of a napkin that somebody randomly put on your table mm -hmm. at a restaurant. Or the liner notes of a specific band that, yeah. you know. Or, or let's say some somebody who's looking up a specific book in a library, and it's not the normal kind of a book that a regular person, and right in the middle of that book is an old bookmark that some previous reader put in there, mm -hmm. and it's got, a, it's got an entry code that will get you in to hear a specific thing. Mm -hmm. I envision that someday we will be communicating in ways like that, you know. Well, we have in the past. Uh, yeah. And we will in the future. And we will continue to have to do that until, as a collective society, we stop resurrecting mm -hmm. the state. Yeah. Civilizations have collapsed before. Right. This is not new. Right. This is and not unknown. It, it's almost a guaranteed. And and people didn't. It, it's a, it's bubbles. It's yeah. cyclic bubbles. <laughs> it, it, and people didn't go crazy and start eating each other. Right. In fact, common people mm -hmm. are pretty much unaffected by this. Yeah. If anything, they're freer. Their life yeah. gets better. Uh, if you lived in, uh, say, southern France. In 500 A.D., when the when Rome was really oppressive, taxes were horrible. Um, soldiers could march through your village at any particular time and raid your farm. You know, it was it was the Rome was getting really oppressive by around that time frame. Mm -hmm. But then, if you leap forward to you know uh, 800 A.D., there was no Rome. Right. Um, there was a remnants of a Holy Roman Empire that was bouncing around in northern France and Germany, and, and there was some things going on. But your average farmer way out in the middle of southern France 
was better off than he was a couple generations back under Rome. Yeah. Well, and, you know, there's this idea that, oh, the Dark Ages, you know, right. it was so terrible. It, and... it was dark because people weren't writing that much down. People weren't writing that much down because the state wasn't there. With Trying their... to glorify itself. Yeah. I, I've talked about that before, that most of history is simply the state lying about itself in mm -hmm. one form or another. Trying to justify itself. Yeah, justifying its, its wars, justifying its conquering. Because without a state, there's nothing really interesting to write about. Yeah, no, life goes on. Because there's no wars, there's no, mm -hmm. I mean, talking about, okay, well, for 500 years, people got up and they ate breakfast and then they worked <laughs> and then they got paid and then they went to the store and they bought stuff and then they ate dinner and then yeah. they went to sleep. That's pretty boring, you know? Yeah, I've talked about that with ancient Ireland, that, you know, Ireland, prior to the the Christians coming in in around, I think, around 600 AD when the Christians started moving into Ireland, prior to that, there was no written history of Ireland as we think of written history. They mm -hmm. had writing, though. Mm -hmm. They had a form of writing where if you were walking down a road and you wondered about where you were, there could be a road sign there with hash marks on it, and that would tell you how far it was to the next town, or it would tell you what the valley it was mm -hmm. named that you were in, or, or whose, whose property. Farmer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would say this is the farm of so and so. You know, um, th that form of written communication was very uh, uh, was all over Ireland, mm -hmm. but they didn't write down their history because there was no king and there was no high priest, mm -hmm. and there was no constant wars, and there was no taxation, so there was no reason to justify, there was no state, so there was no reason to tell the myths of the state. Right. And so you've got no war, no taxation, no uh, reason to justify the state, no myths of the state, there's no history. Right. The only thing they're writing down is, you know, I bought so many weights of, of grain from you, and you bought so many weights of uh, you know, apples from me, and this guy over here uh, did this, and, and it's all commerce. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you don't make history out of commerce. <laughs> no, and most of that stuff is written on on things that A temporary. Yeah, yeah. You scratch it on something, uh, and then you, you know you don't keep shopping lists. Right. <laughs> who who has who has a three hundred year old shopping list? This was my great grandmother's shopping list. <laughs> Once Granny went to the store and she bought eggs, milk, and butter. Yeah, <laughs> it's just not good history. No, it's it's. But the history they did have uh, was oral history. Mm -hmm. And now the wonderful thing about oral history is that first off, it's more fun mm -hmm. than than state history. Because who? Well, there are some of us that are so geeky that we enjoy reading state history, <laughs> but the vast majority of people do not find reading boring state history as being fun and exciting. Right. But everybody likes a good storyteller. Right. So if you have, what's the difference between sitting by yourself in a room reading a history book or sitting around a, a, a stage and watching someone perform a story for you, perform right. a, you know, something, some kind of a, an epic or whatever. And, and the difference is they're not talking about states yeah. they're not talking about faceless mm -hmm. hordes of armies or they're talking about you know there was a guy and mm -hmm. he was really great and he did this yeah he you know? there was this dragon came through the valley and and he conquered it because of his bravery yeah um or there will be some other kind of uh you know it might be around a campfire right. it might be the telling the uh, uh some moral uh some moral tale that has a, a a moral at the end of the tale you know some some type of aesop type um storytelling mm -hmm. and that stuff is fascinating but it's not you don't really consider that history cuz it'll change with each generation mm -hmm. each teller even not even generation each teller that says it modifies it to the audience and so forth right so literally so if you take somebody like um homer and his uh, uh, tales of, of the, like the Iliad or the Odyssey, there are speculations that he was just simply retelling a tale that he had heard that had been retold before that and mm -hmm. been retold before that. And so each generation modified it so that it would appeal to the listening crowd, you know. Well, and the general overall point is, you know, the, the concept is, you know, guy goes to war, 
guy has a really hard time getting back. Wife is faithful and keeps mm-hmm. the house. And when the guy comes back, everyone's rewarded for being faithful. Right. Right. You know, and the in-between so, bits are really not that important. Yeah. So it's a moral lesson that the woman is rewarded for being faithful to her husband mm-hmm. and the husband is rewarded for, you know, uh, for his struggle to come back and, mm-hmm. and... And being faithful to coming back to the homestead. Yeah. Yeah. And the son and the grandfather and the mm-hmm. father, the grandfather, and it's got all the basic characters, but then you adjust the story right. as you need for your audience. You know, and, and so all of those in-between bits, all of the struggles of him... Those are not, you know, yes, we all know that there's not really a witch that lives on the <laughs> island that turns people into pigs. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> but I keep eating the lotus. No, never mind. I don't. It was a joke. It was a joke. Um, but an, an example of that is the movie, Oh, Brother. Uh, where Art oh, Thou? Oh, Brother, mm-hmm. Where Art Thou? Yeah, because that was basically the story of Ulysses. Mm-hmm. That, was the, that was his story put in the depression era south and i thought they did a really good job of doing that yeah you know i don't know you know a lot of people that i know in my family watched that movie and enjoyed it and never read the odyssey right and and i think i guess it's because the story itself is such a good story Mm -hmm. that you don't have to have the background to it right but having the background made that story so much richer because it's like you know it's like all of a sudden it's like Ah, look, it's the Cyclops. <laughs> look, the, he almost got poked in the eye. You know, it, it, at those moments, you connect him to the old story. Mm-hmm. That's totally not the subject, anyway, though, is it? I have no idea where we got to that. You know, this would probably be a good time. Did you, Kai, mm-hmm. did you know that we have sponsors? I had heard something about sponsors and, and you know, that sort of fun stuff. Now would be a good time to take a commercial break for our sponsors. How would you like to support BadQuaker.com and get something nice for yourself at the same time? I want to tell you about Survival Gear Bags. It's run by my friend Kelly, who believes in and adheres to the non-aggression principle. Kelly's customers know him for his great customer service and his personal touch because Kelly handles all customer service himself. The main focus of Survival Gear Bags is to allow you to build your own custom emergency kits with quality gear. Now, I know this because I bought my bug out bag from Survival Gear Bags over two years ago, and I've gone all over the country with it by my side. And you can rest assured that the prices will always be the best they can be at Survival Gear Bags. And if you use the link from badquaker.com, they'll probably throw in something for free for you with your order. Now, how do you do this? Well, it's simple. You go to badquaker.com. On the right side of the page, click on the picture of the backpack. Then look around at Survival Gear Bags and find the stuff you want. You'll help badquaker.com, and you'll support a merchant that's one of us. Now, I want to tell you about another way you can support badquaker.com and get something really cool at the same time. Shire Silver. Shire Silver is the proud seller of silver and gold trade cards. Shire Silver believes that silver and gold trade cards will show the world a better way to save, spend, and share precious metals. So what are silver and gold trade cards? There are specific weights of gold and silver laminated inside credit card sized tradable cards. They're a handy and affordable way to trade precious metals. These cards received nationwide recognition when they were widely used as barter at the New Hampshire Porcupine Festival. You want a beer and a hot dog? Hand them a Shire Silver 5 card and get a Shire Silver 1 spot back as change. So again, what do you do? Well, you go to BadQuaker.com. On the right side, just below the backpack, you'll see the Shire Silver trade cards. Click on those cards and then check out Shire Silver's site. Be sure and watch Ron's video that's right there on the main page. And then swap some of those ridiculous Federal Reserve notes for something of real value. Something you can keep, trade, or give as the coolest gift ever. But be sure and use the link from badquaker.com. Thanks, folks. Wow, wasn't that a great commercial? (laughs) We totally sold out. Yeah, well, you know. (laughs) <laughs> not really, because they're good, oh. not to extend the commercial, but they really are two really good companies that, that are really, they're liberty-oriented and they're trying to do the right thing. So. Yeah. Anyway, so now you uh, were involved in a discussion that we were going to talk about. Yes. Um, on Facebook, uh, I I have liked, I, that's, 
such a weird uh, Facebook is weird. Yeah. Um, I've liked a uh, group a face, a Facebooky thing, a, f- a thing on Facebook. The Libertarian Homeschooler um, on Facebook is really neat, and um, yeah, you know she they're good. They, folks. they talk about how they raise their kids according to libertarian principles, and I don't agree with everything that they talk right. about. But, but they have a lot of good tips and a lot do. of good information. Um, and but you know, really I, I really people. don't think anybody agrees one hundred percent with anything anybody else says. All That's the not time. true. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but there was a discussion that they had brought up that. They had been raising, I think they have, they have what, two boys? Mm, I think so. Um, and they have been raising that if they get into an argument with a girl to come and get a parent, mm-hmm. um, basically saying, you know, you're not allowed to. Can't fight with a girl. Right. You can't fight with a girl. Um, and so this brought up somebody else saying, you know, um, but, you know, what, that doesn't that just teach you to run to the state every time you have a problem? Mm-hmm. And my take on it was it really doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of an, an it's a hard thing to really teach a child because from a strictly libertarian non-aggression principle standing, gender really doesn't matter. Right. If somebody's aggressing on you, you have the right to defend yourself, Mm -hmm. no matter if they're bigger than you or littler than you or whatever gender they are. If they're aggressing, you have the right to defend yourself. Right. But at the same time, there's also social acceptance. You know, Mm -hmm. there's, there's just because it's moral to do something doesn't mean that it's practical to do something. Right. And that's, it's hard to teach a child because a child sees the world so much in black and white yeah. that if it is moral to do something, then mm. you should do it. Yeah. And sometimes it's moral to do something, but you shouldn't do it. Yeah. And we've, a different way of looking at the same thing is we've talked about aggressing, uh, about how the state aggresses upon us. Mm-hmm. And then what should you do about that? Should you fight the state? Mm-hmm. Because of that, well, morally speaking, the state aggresses on us continually. Mm-hmm. From a practical standpoint, if you attack the state, especially let's say, uh, let's say the state aggresses on us through taxation, so we say, okay, fine, we're not going to pay our taxes. Okay, so then they send a guy out to your house. You know, eventually it'll mm-hmm. go through processes first, but eventually they're going to send a guy out to your house, and he's going to attempt to serve papers on you. Mm-hmm. And if you say, "Well, this guy represents the state," and you shoot him, right? Then what's going to that? The, now we've entered. Yes, morally, you have not done anything wrong. Right. Practically, you're going to die. Yeah. Now, now, how good of a libertarian can you be when you're dead? Right. So, from a practical point of view, you you uh, even though it would be perfectly moral perfectly moral to shoot the clown you can't right and you shouldn't right because they will get you and you know with a with a child you can say okay so you're sitting there and you've got your toys and you're playing with your toys and this you know you're you're a boy uh and this girl comes up and knocks over your toys and smacks you and steals Mm -hmm. yes morally speaking you have a right to stand up smack her, take your toys back, and walk away. Right. But practically speaking, there are going to be repercussions if you do so. Yeah, and so that's the delicate part of trying to teach a child. Maybe we should have done this on the... <laughs> <laughs> but but that's the delicate part of how to teach, especially a boy child, mm-hmm. how to defend his property and defend himself against a female attacker without looking like he's a complete jerk right. without looking like he needs a you know a, a sleeveless t-shirt a mullet and a cigarette hanging out of his mouth with a and a, a paps blue ribbon while he's punching <laughs> his girlfriend in the nose you know right. we, that's bad we don't want that <laughs> you know and so okay you're morally correct in that behavior but if you do that mm-hmm. you're going to get kicked out of your play yeah, there, Whatever, there are other or, social ramifications to be considered. Right. On the other hand, you can't teach your co- child just to let themselves be run over and be a doormat to somebody just because it's a female doing right. it. Right, and so, you know, you say, well, if if it's something that escalates past verbal, mm-hmm. then come get an adult. Yeah, an arbitrator. Right. and, yeah. and That's so, not necessarily the state. Exactly. That's not authorizing the state because a libertarian can have an arbitrator. Right, and, and every... 
anarchist society has mm-hmm. had mediators. Right, right. Um, you really can't have a functioning society without a third party neutral mediator to bring a level head to discussions. Mm-hmm. This is a point I think a lot of people are confused when they when they hear me, specifically me talking about the difference between state and government. Mm-hmm. Because that uh, mediators or arbitrators or judges, voluntary only, mm-hmm. not the kind they have like in the US today. But these people are all aspects of a voluntary society and they're all aspects of government. Mm-hmm. Proper government, good, acceptable government. Voluntary government. Volunt- in the sense of the old use of the word govern, which means to keep regular, to right. keep normal. Not to come in and beat you up and tax you and steal your children to fight wars with. Right. That's evil government that's polluted by the state. But government itself, in a family structure, the parents are government. Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't mean the parents have to beat the children. No. But that means that the parents are government. And they can, and, and, and children should feel comfortable voluntarily, uh, looking to, you know, a respectable adult to mediate when there's a conflict Mm -hmm. to keep it from escalating to a physical conflict. Mm -hmm. And especially so when you have a boy and a girl, because the boy has so many obvious, I'm sorry, feminists, the boy has so many obvious physical advantages. Most of the time. To, yeah, in many cases to the girl. Not always, but... You know, uh, there's when you have a 10-year-old girl and you have a 6-year-old boy, yeah. there's a difference there. Some 10-year-old girls can give a pretty good whipping to a 12-year-old boy, too. <laughs> it depends on how motivated they are. Yeah. Well, girls fight dirty anyway. Hey, I never <laughs> fought dirty. Well, it's kind of like another aspect of it is like... Um, uh, in the treatment of male to female relationship, you know, like, f- for example, if my wife and I are out in the public and we're, you know, like going into a, uh, a store or going into a restaurant or something like that, I will open the door for her. And in a way, it's, uh, you know, chivalry, mm-hmm. uh, you, could, you could say like that. But in another sense, I'm dramatically stronger than my wife. So it takes far less effort for me to open a door mm-hmm. than for her to open that door. And and you have to, it's a fine line, especially when you're teaching boys this, because mm-hmm. you don't want to teach them that you're doing this because the woman is weak and they can't do it by themselves. Right. You know, that's not the point. The point is that courtesy says Mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm sorry, but males are expendable. Mm -hmm. And males should be the ones doing physical labor for the protection of their family. There's something very, very natural about males seeking to protect the females. Mm -hmm. And there's something very natural about females accepting that protection to some degree, Mm -hmm. only to the degree that they choose Mm -hmm. Uh, but but there's something very natural within the human species about that right and when we and that was a problem with the with the uh, uh, feminist movement actually is that they would try to deny certain very obvious natural aspects right of the human uh, you know of of the human makeup and that's not to say you know my husband and I heat our house with wood Mm -hmm. our apartment with wood and my husband doesn't like for me to split the firewood he likes to go and make sure that I have enough firewood for the day and mm-hmm. and he likes to take care of all, all of that. And that's not because I can't do it. I mm-hmm. have done it. You mm-hmm. know, if there's no firewood in the house and he's not there, I go split firewood. It's not yeah. it's not that I'm incapable of doing it, but you know, he it's it's his role as the provider of the family. Mm-hmm. You know? And and that's not bad. Right. That's that. It, that is what has worked for humanity for ten thousand years of recorded human history. Mm-hmm. That model has worked. And trying to to <laughs> say all of the sudden that women need to be men, mm-hmm. it doesn't work. And there are in a like let's say if you take it back to a hunter gatherer type uh, setting, a very natural type of a setting. There are female advantages in the hunter-gatherer uh, society, and there are male advantages mm-hmm. in that society. So, for example, uh, a female's sense of smell, sense of touch, and sense of sight, sense of color definition, mm-hmm. are often far superior to a male's 
a sense of of each of those things. Right. For instance, color blindness is far more likely in males than females. So uh, the, where that presents uh, uh, advantages is that if the female is more likely to be looking at berries, touching fruit, touching leaves, examining them, smelling them, seeing if they're acceptable, mm -hmm. where the man is essentially, you know, huddled behind a bush waiting for movement right. that he can jump out on and, and stab with a rock. Yeah, you don't really have to be worried about if that antelope is poison. Yeah. But you really do have to be worried if that leaf is poison. Yeah. So, I mean, there are a lot of predators that are, that are colorblind. Mm -hmm. they, they see shadows of of gray or shades of gray and and black and white it's actually it's a it's it's easier to de to detect movement mm -hmm. if you don't have a whole lot of colors yeah interrupting your your train of thought yeah so so for that reason males uh were superior at that aspect of the hunter gatherer relationship whereas females were superior at providing things that weren't rotted or poisoned right. or you know, were and, properly ripened. And not ripened. to be, you know, not to be crude, but women are more important in the reproduction process than men are. Exactly. Um, I mean, that's just the basic it, facts. It, we, it, we might not like that yeah. or you might want to, you know, uh, it might be awkward to, yeah, to talk about but, it publicly. But females are far more precious than males mm -hmm. are, you know, and, and societal norms aside, there, if, you know, one man can mm -hmm. reproduce far more than one woman can. Right. You know, so it's, it's natural for a man to be expendable. Yeah. And not that that doesn't mean that they're not important. They are. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if somebody's going to be leaping out in front of a lion. Yeah, it needs to be the guy. It needs to be the person who's not responsible for the continuation of that species. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. That that reminds me. I was, uh, there. there's back to Facebook again. There's a person on Facebook that uh, that I'm, you know, what do you call it? Friends. Fr yeah, friends, which is, again, an awkward Facebook terminology. <laughs> Um, and he's in Apparently the, everyone on Facebook is a Quaker. They're yeah, all friends. They're all friends. Isn't that great? It's the biggest Quaker society <laughs> in the world. No, not really. Anyway, he's in the UK. And so one of the issues that is important to him is pointing out regularly how illegitimate the uh, English monarchy is and how... <laughs> um, how Always a fun pastime. Yeah, yeah, and how they're actually German. They're not even English. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really, you know, he, he hits it pretty hard. Um, and, th and the other day he linked to a thing that was saying, basically, uh, most English are not English. Most English are of Germanic descent because they either come, they, they either are, are of Norman uh, descent, mm -hmm. which is was you know French and Viking uh, background, Vikings right. that became French that then invaded England, or else they're from the Anglo-Saxon invasion, which means they're from you know uh, they're uh, Dutch or Holland or uh, one of the areas of the Norman Germanic areas up right. in there. Uh, either way, they're not technically English. Right. <laughs> um, well. Uh, and but then if you go to a place like Wales, and and the and the the thing that he linked to was talking specifically about genetics, mm -hmm. how if they go through and they use male, uh, the male chromosomes or the male genome or whatever I don't know I'm not a scientist type person but but they they follow the male back and it tra it goes almost unchanged from generation to generation right and they can trace that back and they can say well the vast majority of English people tested are not of they're not Britons, right. so to speak, the ancient Britons. They're, they're, if you stick, if you stick strictly with the male testing, then you're going to see that they're Germanic. They're right. not Britain. And, but then that's only one side of that equation. If you check the females, they carry a whole different signature in, right. in their genome. And if you check the females, you see that, uh, indeed they are British. Right. It's just that it's the male just that side. It's the males get killed off. Yeah. Because when a conquering uh, force comes in. Or even a dominating force, even if it's not, like, like for instance, okay, what you were about to say, I interrupted you, but what you were about to say is that the males kill the males. Right. And then the females are left but alive. But they don't kill the females. Right. Because the females 
are important to the survival of the species. Right. It's I'm, ingrained in the lizard brain of humans to say, oh, protect you females. You admitted we're lizards. Oh, no. <laughs> Space alien lizard people from Mars. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's exactly true. So, so one invading army will kill the ma many of the males of the other army, but then they will bring the females in and into. Uh, and this is basic pack, yeah, maneuvering. Yeah, you know, you see two horses, mm -hmm. two male horses of two different packs. They fight. One drives off or kills the other, and mm -hmm. the females transfer to the other herd. Yeah, to the stronger male. Right. Uh, for because he clearly has stronger genetics, and so he's right. going to produce better uh, breeding stock. Um, you know, not to be crude, but right. that's what we're talking about. Um, now, there's another method that took place in Britain that is far more logical and less violent. As the Saxons moved in, they were they were moving into a Britain that had just faced the collapse of Rome. Mm -hmm. In other words, a bubble popped mm -hmm. and they were economically devastated because they lost the support of Rome. Right. So you have all these Britons living in, in England that were under devastating financial problems because Rome had collapsed. And in the middle of this, in comes these waves of Germanic uh, settlers who were somewhat wealthy. Right. Uh, the, the Saxons, as they moved into Britain, they, they, had been, they had never had to deal with the Roman menace. So all the years that the Britons were held down by the government of Rome, uh, Saxony, they were prosperous. Right. They did not have a state at all. So they had gone for thousands and thousands of years with no state and prospered that whole time. So as the Saxons overpopulated Saxony <laughs> because of the abundance of what, you know, and they literally needed more places to go and spread their wealth, they moved into Britain. And the Britons that were there were impoverished. They were in serious financial problem because right. they had been depending on the state, and now the state had dried up on them. So as the Saxons moved in, they brought with them technologies that were better than the old Roman stuff. Mm -hmm. We know they were better because they held off the Romans. Right. So, you know, it doesn't <laughs> matter the state propaganda from the Romans were that they were barbarians. Right. That they were, you know, horrible barbarians, but they weren't. That's a lie. They were actually very prosperous and the successful. State lying? What? Yeah. That doesn't happen. So as the Saxons moved in, sure, I'm sure there were conflict. Right. And I'm sure men killed men. Pro you know, I'm sure that happened. Right. But what is more likely is that women, Br Britain women, saw very prosperous, handsome, young Germanic Saxons mm -hmm. with their fancy armor and their fancy horses and their fancy new building style that, that they were building buildings with that were far superior to what uh, the Romans had left behind and mm -hmm. the rubble that the Romans had left. And the female Britons were more attracted to the successful Saxons than their Britain brothers that were less successful right well also you have an issue of um so you've got a group of people who are going out to basically colonize a new area mm -hmm. um people who go to do that are uh non-attached males and families very and often families are you know they're the, already locked in right yeah but the unattached males go find women right but not a whole lot of unattached females mm -hmm. go and... Yeah, you don't see a lot of German women going, you know what we need to do is go to Britain and get us a man. Yeah, <laughs> because there was prosperity in right. Saxony, in yeah. Germany. Yeah, but, but you do see, as a matter of fact, you do see men, even in successful areas, going, hey, let's go over there and see if we can find us some women. Yeah. Because <laughs> men are hound dogs. <laughs> Oh, so, yeah, so even the genetic information, according to whether you want to believe that there was this violent attack and this, you know... Well, it's it's whether you want to believe that these Germanic people were violent, horrible barbarians because they didn't have a state keeping them in control, mm -hmm. or whether you want to believe that they were prosperous... Businessmen. Businessmen going to... Uh, taking advantage of opportunities. Going to an open market that had suddenly yeah. opened up. 
And and you can see this more vividly with the Vikings moving into Ireland mm -hmm. because uh, Vikings had a tendency to move into a, an area in a very bold and forward fashion. But in moving... <laughs> Vikings were not subtle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but in moving into Ireland, they tended, even though their initial entry sometimes was rather bold, um, they blended into Irish society very well. <laughs> Irish introductions can be a little bold sometimes, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, we will not make Irish stereotypical jokes. Well, we can do that. Because we're Irish. Well, considering that uh, among the many things that, that make up the, uh, our That's genetics. That's the great thing about being mutts, because, yeah. you know, we can make fun of a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, to a large degree, though, that we are uh, Appalachian Scotch Irish, so we can, uh, we're, we have a license to make fun of not only the Scotch Irish, but the Irish and the Scotch, and we can certainly make fun of the English because, you know, we we fought with them for thousands of years. Why not? So speaking of you know men rushing off into the wilderness to <laughs> conquer new lands and form new lives. Yeah. Um, we've got this guy that, uh, you know, lived for two months in his car on nothing but snow. In the Arctic Circle. Yeah. Yeah, this was a story, the first part of the week, it just splattered all over the internet and all the news outlets were talking about it. This guy in Sweden at or around the Arctic Circle that was trapped in a snowbank inside his car for like two months. Mm-hmm. Some of the fantastic headlines that were associated with this story were things like um, when rescuers found him, he only had cigarettes and a comic book. Right. Which is a big flashing warning sign right there. Yeah. But, well, here's my big flashing warning sign. Two months in a car. Where did you go to the bathroom? Because <laughs> two months worth of going to the bathroom? Mm -hmm. That's pretty mm. obvious yeah yeah um and and also th with the cigarettes there's no cigarette smoker on the face of the planet that can ration their cigarettes that long well plus you wouldn't know going into it like like if he was out driving his car mm -hmm. randomly and gets stuck in a snowbank and he looks at his supply of cigarettes and he's like i have you know, this many mm -hmm. cigarettes. Okay, now I know for a fact that I'm going to be in this snowbank for two months. Now I can ration out, and if I have this much, mm -hmm. you know, every so many hours and this much so ever so many days, then I then I will still have enough cigarettes so that when the rescuers find me in two months, they'll be able to put this headline out that says, all I had was cigarettes and a comic book. Right. That's not likely. No. And, There's nothing about that scenario that makes and sense. And that, that's not the way that addicts work. No. <laughs> um, addicts, I have been around people who smoke cigarettes who were, uh, you know, okay, you need this pack of cigarettes to last you all week. Yeah. Well, hey, guess what? By... Wednesday, you don't have any cigarettes. Yeah. It doesn't matter how... You what go good... into it knowing, yeah. Yeah. you know, I can only have three cigarettes a day, mm -hmm. and by Wednesday, you've smoked all your cigarettes. Yeah. Because uh, that's the nature of an addiction. Yeah. Whether you're talking about the alcoholic, or you're talking about the Coke user, or whether you... It doesn't matter what the, what the addiction is. Yeah. You use it to feed the addiction as required by the addiction yeah. until it's all gone. Yeah. And then you go through whatever withdrawals that you're going to have to tolerate. So if his story is legit, either he just randomly had, you know, a lot of cigarettes, two months worth of cigarettes to begin with. Right. Or else the story's flawed. Yeah. Um, that That's the first red flag. But then also they, they were saying things like um, one of the headlines that went with, with it was uh, experts say he went into hibernation. Some kind of hibernation. Yeah, some kind of bear-like hibernation. Oh, and, and he existed living off of snow that he had yeah. reached out and, and grabbed through the window. Yeah. Yeah, he lived off of snow and he went into some kind of hibernation. And, you know, there's all these headlines that are, that are grab the, the viewer and everything. Mm -hmm. And I had seen this story popping up all over the internet. 
and the same they're all glorifying the same set of information but they're not really digging down to tell the story right and then i found one i think it was um the daily mail a british organization <laughs> and, I, and i'm not saying anything good or bad about them but they they basically tell the same story right except they make a mistake <laughs> they actually included a picture of his car and i you know i'd seen this on fox i'd seen this all over the internet and none of them had pictures of the interior of his car. Which is interesting because, obviously, if this website was showing pictures of the car, it's then that available. means that there are pictures, yeah. which means why are you not showing pictures? Mm -hmm. You know that the pictures don't match up with your story. Yeah, exactly. Now, so, I've seen pictures so of the outside. So that moves it from this reporter doesn't know what they're talking about it, right. to this port reporter does know what they're talking about, and they want this specific story. Yeah. And they're specifically using it despite the fact that they know that it's not that story. Yeah, it goes away from the possibility of just an idiot reporter mm -hmm. to deception mm -hmm. to, in order to sell the story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's exactly what happened. Now, I had seen uh, some pictures from the outside of the car with the snow piled up on it. You mm -hmm. know, it's like four feet of snow on the top. And the, the snow bank, the infamous snow bank that the car stuck in and, and how bad the car was buried and everything like this. But only the one place I actually saw a picture in through the window looking into the car. Mm -hmm. And what do you see? Well, you see a parka and a backpack and what looks like a refrigerator or possibly a heating unit. Mm -hmm. And you see lots and lots and lots of food wrappers. Mm -hmm. You know, Starbucks beer, coffee. Beer bottles and yeah. Uh, and what it appears in every way to me, and you know, we were looking at this, mm -hmm. we, we kind of came to the same conclusion. This is a guy who had just recently got kicked out of his home. He he had a bunch of bills. He his his world fell apart. His finances fell apart. His girlfriend dumped him. His job dumped him. His everything in his life dumped him, and he's in his car, and he probably in the last moments before getting kicked out of his apartment or whatever, he grabbed whatever food items that he had, shoved them in his car, drives down the road gets really, really tired, pulls off to take a nap, and can't get his car unstuck. Right. That's, uh, that's one possibility. You know, y if you're willing to extend the possibility that this guy really was in this car for two months, which, honestly, I'm not willing to give him that possibility mm. because that story is incredibly unbelievable to me. Mm -hmm. What is far more believable to me being around people who live in cars mm -hmm. is you pulled off or you th that's where you've parked your car to live yeah and a cop comes by and is harassing you and says you know why are you here and instead of going to jail for being a vagrant you're yeah. like i just got unstuck from the snowbank yeah you know yeah i've been here not for two months because i chose to be right but i've been here for two months because my car was stuck please help me officer right which or was it really two months do we know it was two months was it because the story says december 18th was when he was stuck and that's going by what right you know, do we have some kind of forensic evidence that supports that, or is it the guy's word? Right. Or is it that's the last time a you know a crew came through that area? Or, right. You know, well, these stories only half report the story anyway because it's the mainstream media. And it it's very easy to just say, you know, oh no, officer, I'm not a vagrant homeless person that lives in my car that you should arrest. Right. I'm a traveler that got stuck. I'm a victim. Help me. I'm amazing. I can hibernate like a bear. Yeah. Quick, someone tell my story to the media. You know, once you've told the cop that and the cop leaks it to the media and the media are there interviewing you, you can't say, well, no, actually, yeah. you know, I was able to get out on several occasions. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't say that. Or in what's actually really likely is that the the story was put out and one media outlet uh, did the story mm -hmm. and then every other media outlet since then is just rehashing the same information from the same original story they mm -hmm. don't actually you know investigate anything no. themselves they take the most sensational aspects of the original story and then do a whole new story based on those yep. sensational aspects and they never really drill down to what the real story is yeah 
it's not just laziness. Right. They deliberately want specific stories mm -hmm. to be told in specific ways. Now, if you take that little piece of information on how they handled a guy in his car, mm -hmm. and then you realize they're telling people whether or not we should go and attack a foreign country. Mm -hmm. These same people who are guiding the public, uh, the public opinion about a guy frozen in his car, those same people are telling us whether or not Iran really is trying to get a nuclear missile and kill us or not. Yeah. And, and that's not to say that Iran is not evil. They might want all of us dead. Not the point. Right. The point is, if the media tells me, I'm not only assuming I can't believe it, I'm assuming it's a lie. Yeah. All right. I guess we should wrap up. Yeah. So for more on liberty, the zero aggression principle, and property rights, go to badquaker.com. And thanks, folks, for listening. Thank you.